Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our, uh, feels like a weekly session now, but we're trying to, try to uh, maybe go uh, once a month pretty soon here because we're running out of the uh, uh, summertime. Um, welcome, everybody. This is our ninth uh, session of the summer. Uh, I hope everybody is uh, staying well and safe. Um, let's go quickly through the introduction here. As always, thank you to Slalom uh, and uh, Precocity, both our sponsors who've been with us for a couple of years and allow us to have those really awesome Zoom meetings with all of you guys. Um, as always, this is the uh, Dallas uh, chapter of the Service Design Network. So I am Greg Lacluffy, and there is uh, here Brandon Ward. Say hi, Brandon. Uh, and we have Christopher Roberts and Brenda as well. Um, very quickly, uh, this event is recorded as usual. So if you haven't seen the past events, or if you want to catch up and see uh, if you've missed one, you can always go to our YouTube channel, look for the Service Design Network Dallas chapter. And I think we have eight sessions right now. And today's session will be live probably this evening, maybe tomorrow, depending on the, the bandwidth and uh, the upload time. So by any means, just feel free to go and check out the past sessions and to circulate those and to spread the knowledge to other people. Uh, very quickly, I wanted to bring up uh, the Series and Network. So obviously, a lot of people on this call uh, are aware of it. Uh, some of you are not. So I want to really, uh, do a quick intro uh, since our uh, guest today is a big part of the network. Um, so we are Service Design Network, the Dallas chapter. So uh, we have been doing some a lot of physical events. Obviously, because of COVID-19, we've been doing some virtual events the past several months. Uh, and we will probably be alternating physical and virtual events over the rest of 2020. Um, very quickly, the Service Design Network is a nonprofit organization all over the world. Um, that is, uh, the, the goal is to uh, provide knowledge to all service designers and organizations um, who actually want to know more about service design and how to implement it. Um, we have 18,000 members all over the world, uh, uh, mostly professional practitioners, but also a lot of like corporations and students as well. Um, it's a global presence. Uh, I believe there are 45 uh, global chapters. Um, there may be more now. Uh, I haven't kept track, but I think it's, it's definitely a, a wide covering of uh, uh, on the world. Uh, we also have awesome global events. So very quickly, I want to talk to you about this year. Obviously, because of COVID-19, the Copenhagen event was pushed to next year. Uh, and this year, there will be a virtual event. And maybe Jesse can talk to this very quickly when he, uh, when he speaks to us uh, in, a, in a few minutes. But uh, there will be a virtual event this year, uh, probably around uh, the end of October. Um, it's a really great event. It's unfortunate it's going to be uh, virtual this year, but it's usually a great place to mingle and to network and to meet a fellow service designer. But this year is a strange time we live in. So uh, it'd be a, a virtual event. Um, there's also some great service and resources. So people always ask us, where can I find this? Where can I find that? Uh, how can I know more about this or that? Um, you can become a member of the service and network and you have a lot of benefits uh, that go along with the memberships. Um, you can have your profile. There is, a, there is a touch point journal, which Jesse is the editor in chief. Uh, there is some there's a library. So let me go quickly through some of those memberships. So uh, there are some books and impact reports that actually do uh, a deep dive into some specific um, topics um, like the health sector, public sector, or financial services. Uh, there is a Touchpoint magazine. So uh, Jesse Grimes today here is the editor in chief, and he will talk more about this uh, in his uh, presentation. But definitely, great magazines. I believe it is the only magazine about service design in the world. So um, I don't want to be uh, um, bragging, but it's a great, great magazine to read. Um, there is also some uh, training. You can actually have some uh, accreditation through Service and Network to become an accredited trainer. Um, there is an academy uh, that is, uh, I, I believe it's in Amsterdam, uh, the physical uh, place, but it will be uh, virtual most likely next year as well. Um, so if you want to know more about it, there's different level. There is, I think, the, the student level. If you're a student, I think it's like, um, I think 40 euros a year, uh, and you can actually have free access to this uh, this membership, and it goes up depending on your, on your level of membership. Any question yet? Maybe. All right. So today um, we're gonna go through um, the quick agenda here. 
So today we have the wonderful Jesse Grams from the Service and Network. He's joining us from Berlin, Germany. Um, we've had some very uh, high level academic topic in the past uh, about like facilitation or, or, or blueprinting. Um, Jesse is going to be talking to us about a very small space, which is the innovation and startup space, where Service Design is actually doing very well. Um, on July 14th, we'll have Megan Miller from Stanford University and David Flowers from Intuit. They will give us some super practical tips about service design. Um, they are very well known in the service design space and they will be with us and give us some really awesome tips about how to become better designers in the service design space. Um, and we had uh, Irene Norges a couple of weeks ago from the city of San Francisco and she was so incredible and gave us such a great view into the government work she's doing for the city of San Francisco that we will have her back. Uh, she's coming back on August the 11th and she will be joined by Azad Damur from Panime in DC and it will tell us more about what Sri Design is doing in the uh, government space, uh, which is very different than the corporate space. Um, so we're looking forward to know more about this and have her back and tell us more about some very different spaces than some of us are used to. So today we're going to have uh, Jesse, who's going to talk to us about uh, the startup space, innovation space. So I know a lot of us are working for companies who actually uh, are startups or are, want to behave like startups. Uh, and definitely the innovation space is somewhere, uh, service design has a lot of uh, a cloud. Uh, service design is used in a lot of those innovation spaces. So we know more about exactly what, um, what you discover in there, either if you actually want to go into this space or if you are in this space and trying to get better at it. Um, super quick question for all of you guys out there. If you have a question for Jesse uh, towards the end of the session, uh, please use the chat room. Um, if you don't mind, make it easy for Brendan and Christopher and Brenda uh, in the chat. It's usually very active and very engaged. So go ahead and just make sure they actually see the question for Jesse. So whatever you want to say, just say question to Jesse or question to panel, you know, and just make it clear to them that it's a question for Jesse. So at the end of the presentation, he can address those directly with you guys. Um, so today we have Jesse. So we're going to uh, let Jesse introduce himself very quickly for those of you who are not aware of uh, what he does. Um, he's the editor in chief of the Touchpoint magazine, the Swiss Design Network, which I just described. Um, Jesse, welcome. Thank you. Um, if you have a couple of minutes, just let us know about who you are, what you do, and. Um, Let's go. Sure. So, um, yeah, thanks again for, for joining uh, and allowing me to, to speak to you guys. I'm happy to be part of uh, a really nice lineup of speakers that you guys have put together um, as a chapter. So I'm uh, Jesse Grimes. I've been involved in the service design network uh, really since its beginning in 2008. Um, and that was also the year that I started practicing service design myself. I started the service design practice at an agency uh, just outside Amsterdam. So I'm actually I'm living in, in uh, joining you guys from Amsterdam today, not uh, not Berlin. Um, I'm for the last bit more than a year. I'm a freelance service designer myself. So next to my volunteer work in the SDN, I'm working with clients around the world for service design uh, projects on a, on a contracting basis. Um, within the SDN, I'm involved in Touchpoint, as you mentioned, and also setting up um, the academy, which is also a global a global offering of ours, which is uh, kind of like our events nowadays, um, mostly online. But we do do physical trainings, and we'll start doing them. Uh, again soon. So that's uh, that's myself. Very good. I have a few questions for you, if you don't mind, before we, we kick start. Um, what recent tool or methodology do you think has the biggest impact on how your team works and what you create in service design? Sure. So there's something actually, if I go back to 2008, when I, when I started doing uh, service design for the first time, my colleagues and I came up with something which we call the service ecosystem. And this was a uh, a visualization that we do very early on in a project which tries to bring into one kind of overview all of the interactions and all of the touch points in which someone's experiencing a service. Um, it's even a few more levels zoomed out than a customer journey, which we're all very uh, familiar with. And I have I found this actually to be one of the most useful deliverables that I've that I ever work with. It's something I do early on in a project, either to try to build an understanding of what service design is for my client and within the team I'm in, and even to expose people in the project to the complexity of the service that they either have in the market or that they're planning to design. It's 
it's a simple, uh, simple diagram, a simple visualization. I've wrote about it uh, a fair bit, and if you uh, if you Google it, certainly with my name, you'll find some of my writing. I've shared at the end of my presentation as well. Um, but this is a, and in fact, uh, ironically enough, I'm approaching the end of a long bit of design research for my current client, and today I've been working on this in th Zoom instead of in uh, getting together and post-its on walls. But uh, I've been working this service ecosystem really uh, just today. So so it's, it's uh, fresh in my mind. Very cool. Um, another question, you okay with that? Sure, sure. What shifts are you seeing currently in service design? So I think this is actually a nice follow on to a topic of one of your previous talks I just saw on the slide, and that is what future service designers look like. Um, I think it's we're, we're, we have quite an interesting discipline. If you were to describe to someone the job titles that are our colleagues, a front-end engineer, a design researcher, a UX designer, a product owner, you have a very clear understanding of who they are, what their, what their tools look like, what their deliverables look like. More and more what I'm seeing is that the role of service designer itself is maybe fragmenting sounds like a too strong or even a negative word, but I, I think our role is kind of fragmenting. We're seeing people, and I, I know colleagues and people I work with as well that really embody this, service designers are having specialties, which mean that just saying you're a service designer does no longer give a very clear sense of what your skills are and, and what you bring to a project. Some people bring a business design mindset. They might even have something like an MBA. They know really how to interact with a client at a strategic level and get in, the, in involved in the numbers in a project. Some designers, some service designers really specialize in facilitation and running workshops and doing collaborative things. Some are on the prototyping side, um, using even techniques from the theater that I'm sure Adam probably shared with you. Um, it means that there's a really wide variety of what what people that call ourselves service designers are doing. And I tackled that a little bit in an article I wrote last year about how can we visualize our skills in some kind of diagram which shows what our capabilities are and where, where we have some less capabilities. But I'm essentially seeing that, that we're, we're growing into certain specialisms that allow us to um, yeah, focus on some things where our strengths lie and, and also uh, dis disregard some others. Are you talking specifically in the U.S. or on a global platform? Because you know, the U.S. is a bit behind in terms of maturity for service design. So are we following the same trends that you've seen in Europe or? I think for sure follow, following the same trend. Yeah, fo yeah, that's, and I mean, you've got some of the best service design education there too. And um, I think it's, it's gonna be a natural, uh, kind of a natural byproduct of that maturity. And as us as service designers working in different projects and finding our own specialties, um, some people I've worked with have come out of product design, some have been architects, some have been copywriters. Um, they then go on to have specialisms that, that cover just a specific area of service design, but I think it's kind of a natural outcome. I hope, and this has been a question sometimes, does that mean that service design as a named discipline won't exist in a, f a few years? Um, I personally hope not. Maybe it's a bit selfish because I've been really trying to grow our community and, and uh, have, a, have an identity for ourselves. And I think it would, at this young age, maybe a bit, a bit counterproductive to say, no, we don't need the job title and we can, we can specialize and come up with our, our, own, uh, our own titles. Um, but that is sometimes a question. That's interesting. So you're saying that you know, in the future, as, as you know, right now we have some some issue about looking for jobs. People just put service designer job, and it's not even service design. It's like UI, UX, something, something, right? So are you saying that you know, in the near future it would be like service design slash something, like a higher de degree of uh, of sophistication? It's funny. So even as a even as a freelancer, I've been approached by clients who say, "Look, at, we're looking for a service designer who can also build all our prototypes in Sketch and Envision. They can run the user research and they can get involved in the agile process by which we launch a, a product." And I think, "Oh, this sounds like an interesting client, but the ask you have is much too big for one role." I really think, as a service designer, if I'm going to adequately fill the shoes that I've got. I want to have a strategic, holistic view of a service to be designed and not to be hands down into, into Sketcher and Vision on what screens look like. I can't be spending all my time doing design research. So I, I think we need to protect the understanding what that is and not, and not allow that to be watered down. 
how do we educate clients about what a service designer is and what we bring to a project? That's that's a good challenge. But like you're saying, Greg, I've, I've certainly seen people who kind of throw it in as a jack of all trades because they think it's important, but they sometimes I think have unrealistic expectations of, of uh, all those roles in one person. So that's fair. That's actually uh, another topic for another day probably. Uh, one more question and we'll talk about innovation in startups, okay? Sure, sure. What do you see as the new frontiers or areas of opportunity for service design? So one of them, of course, is going to be the topic of my talk. I do think that you'll find a smattering of service designers in these innovation spaces and within startups. But I think by and large, um, that's really not a place where our discipline is known. If you, if you walk into the biggest banks around the world, I promise you, you'll find teams of internal service designers uh, more and more within the public sector. And certainly in some countries, specifically, service design has established itself really well. Um, startups, by the nature of where they've where they've grown, or at least where the techniques that startups follow um, have originated, so that's Silicon Valley, reflects the fact that service design being less mature in the States means that it was not a known thing when people were coming up with what, what means startup looks like. And it means that those who follow the, the playbooks of, of startups and innovation labs to some extent are not familiar with service design and therefore we are a bit of an unknown quantity there. Um, on the other side, one of my current clients now is a big global uh, agriculture company. And again, consumer facing service providers like banks, um, retailers, travel companies who really live and die in customer service have adopted service design really well. This agriculture client that I'm doing sees the value in it, but they're quite they're quite new to it. And actually, one of my first service design clients in 2008 was also in the agriculture space. Um, so I think there's big there's potential in big industry clients, in transport, in utilities, um, in companies that may not even have a direct consumer facing product or service offering, but who need to think about their a business to business offering, who start to use the techniques from from the service designers toolkit. Um, I think that's where a lot of potential can, can be, not just innovations, innovation contexts and, and small startups, but big industries which don't have the, the pressure that banks have to, to innovate uh, and who are less known to service designers. Very cool. So I guess it's going to be a nice segue to go into innovation and maybe we can talk more about a true startup or a large company who wants to behave like a startup, which I know is a, is a misnomer, but you may actually have a, an opinion around that. Um, let's see. So if you guys have any questions, some questions already trickling in for Jesse. So we're going to handle that. Um, and we're just going to ask Jesse's questions in probably 30 minutes, I'm guessing. Right, Jesse? Sure. Yeah. If, uh, yeah. That's about, about how long my, my presentation okay. will be. Just go ahead and take over the, the screen and just uh, you get a stage. Okay, let me get my presentation. Okay, I've got to ask the standard question. Can you see my screen or something different? Yes, we can. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so I think I did a little bit of an introduction, but uh, just to be, um, just to cover it off again, um, a little bit who I am. I've got about 21 years of design consulting experience. I was doing uh, UX design actually for the 11 years before I made the switch to service design, so I come from a uh, long time ago. I'm based here in Amsterdam, so I'm working with clients, um, especially nowadays. My clients are actually none of them based in the Netherlands. Um, I am involved in the Service Design Network, as, you, as you've said, and involved in Touchpoint. And the basis for my talk is, in the last few years, I've really had a focus on um, how we how we as service designers have a role within innovation contexts and startups. And I'm currently working on and off with two uh, individual startups, both actually based in, in Germany. Now, a context for this talk, I've had this focus on uh, service design for innovation and in, in, uh, startups back since 2016. And at that time, I was uh, working as a service designer and uh, design thinking uh, consultant or, or coach within one of the big Dutch banks' uh, innovation labs or, or, or accelerators. Um, it was the first time I was really working. I'd spent many, many years working within big banks in their typical day-to-day -day business operations. And this was a change to working with two and three person startup teams 
Um, and it really opened my eyes to what I saw as opportunity, but also honestly some real challenges in, in how I could support startup teams. Um, I've gone on to teach some courses on these topics um, around the world and to coach and work with some other accelerators. And now I've been doing it with some uh, standalone startups that don't exist within the uh, accelerator uh, context. And this talk is based on an issue that we had in Touchpoint uh, last year, beginning of last year, um, focused on this. And I know this is a bit of a plug because I work for it, but I, I'll share with you at the end of this talk some links where you can find it. But my talk and is based on one article that I've written in here, but there's a lot of really great contributions from people within the startup world, also um, from within uh, innovators and kind of accelerators, people from Board of Innovation. I invited someone who sometimes gives this talk alongside me, uh, Mike Pinder, to, to contribute an article. Um, that's really uh, something to look at as well. So that's a bit of context. In the talk itself, um, I'm going to take two different perspectives. The first is, what's the value of service design for startups? And the second is, okay, what are the chances and the opportunities for us as service designers to be working in that space? And especially if it's um, something that's kind of uh, new to us or, or we're not, not, um, yeah, not used to it. So let's go into the, the, the first section now. I want to put this into a little bit of context and show you a figure of where startups uh, are, what markets they're in, what sectors they're in. This is a few years old now, but I think it generally um, should be accurate. And this is where, what industry startups are focused on. And fintech, um, I think also related naturally to the, the big role that service design have within banks. Uh, fintechs are uh, really some of the, mo most of the startups are in the fintech space. And this is actually a, a summit, a, a conference or convention aimed at the design community within fintechs. It's been going on a few years. This is actually a screenshot I took on the website from their 2020 edition, I, which I think went ahead in some form or other this spring. And you can see in this job title, uh, this uh, slide, all the job titles that they're trying to attract to this conference, designers working within the fintech space. And I think there's a bit of a notif noticeable absence here, and that is service design. How, how come there's um, of all these design roles, uh, nobody named service designers? And I think this is kind of indicative of the lack of awareness of um, our discipline, our role, and what we can bring within, uh, not just fintechs, but within startups generally. So my proposition here, and the, the kind of proposition I, I've had when I approach and work with them is that service design, and whether, whether you want to cap, wrap it up in this concept of service design thinking, can help innovators, so startups, deliver better products, earn stronger customer relationships, and create even more value than, than they're doing currently. Now, if we look at what, uh, the, what the opportunity for service design is, I think it makes sense to see how innovation typically works. And this is uh, also, if you look at a lot of the, the literature for startups and methodologies that they follow, it's about coming up with a concept, testing that concept, and then scaling it. And it's primarily in those first two activities, those first two focus areas of a startup where I see service design uh, potentially adding a lot of value. And th this is different from the context that we're normally used to. This is a lot more pressure than a, than a big uh, corporate client, a big bank, a big uh, government agency. Um, the teams are much smaller. There's a lot faster iterations. It is an environment that's uh, different than the typical uh, ones that service designers are accustomed to. And I also think it uh, makes sense to look for a moment at what successful innovation is called. What what makes a startup think that they've they've done it well? And and successful innovation is three things. It's it's not just the creative ideas that a startup can come up with, which is their their concepts they want to bring to the market. It's the ones that deliver value to their customers. This is something that as service designers we can. Uh, really relate to or think about, but it's also ones that are actually going to be sustainable and viable and make some make some money. So the business side of something. So a successful business concept, a successful startup, has to really nail all these three these three things to to grow. Now, if we take those three requirements, I'm convinced that service design can definitely play a role with the first two of those, and actually maybe play a role with the third one, which is really much more of a business and a scaling question. So if we start with those, 
what are the things that we're familiar with as service designers? What are our activities and how can they relate to those three key pillars of, of a successful uh, startup? The first is around concepting. We can use our co-creation techniques and our ideation techniques to help find that, um, find that winning concept. We can apply all of the contextual research and, and research skills that we've got, uh, also prototyping and user research towards understanding and making sure that the value proposition is right. And for those service designers who bring business design skills to the table, we can play a, a super important role into the business discussion, into the viability of what a, what a startup's business model might be. Now, I also think it's interesting to show the typical five-day Google Ventures uh, design sprint approach that a lot of startups are familiar with and has, of course, trickled out into the, the, the rest of the world. And this is spending a day on mapping and targeting what, where you want to go, sketching solutions, choosing a solution, prototyping, and testing it. Now, I have a really pretty strong criticism of this um, from a service designer's perspective, and that is we are keeping the involvement of users until the very last day. And if we're meant to be uh, not just doing things like co-creation, but deeply understanding our users, doing customer journeys at the start of our normal projects, how come we would be allowing ourselves to be four uh, days into a five-day project until we're speaking to users? So one sharp criticism of, of design sprints that, that I've made, but how can you make this a little bit more tangible? Um, the first is that there are a lot of things that are uh, familiar to us that we do in normal projects that we can actually adapt to this uh, design sprint approach. So can we bring in contextual research or other research methods back in the very beginning? Can we map a, an as-is journey or a current state customer journey um, around the experience that, that we're trying to build a proposition for? Can we use co-creation? Um, I'll mention the service ecosystem a, a, a bit more in, uh, in the future, but it, can we visualize what the solution space looks like uh, early on? Can we involve users into the selection of the eventual solution through co-creation? Um, can we get them involved in prototyping? And at the very end, can we stay away from super simplistic um, tests like A-B tests using Facebook? And can we bring to bear all of the research skills that service designers have and, and our design research brethren have um, to determine if an idea is good or not and validate it and not use the really simplistic approaches that uh, things like Lean Startup do? So this was just a very specific uh, focus on um, where I see some failures in, in one thing that, that uh, the startup community are really um, in love with. Now, if we move on, I think it's important to recognize that service designer and uh, service design and lean startup are not the best of buddies for quite a few reasons. And I think I, I can show, show these kind of briefly side by side. The first comes to something that's both semantic but a mindset difference, and that is as service designers, we think about a holistic service experience, whereas lean startup and startup methodologies are very product centric. You see it in the terminology, the language of job titles, things like product owner, product manager. Um, uh, product is the way they think, and it's even if you approach it as a semantic point of view, it can be a barrier to how we operate. I think lean startup has as I mentioned a moment ago, quite a shallow understanding of who users are. They're concerned about, okay, can we launch a product that relieves a pain? Whereas as service designers, we really want to find a better, deeper contextual understanding of who our users are um, of a service. I do think within Lean Startup, there's also quite a s simplistic concept of whether a concept is working or not. And that can be through the use of landing pages and sometimes even deceptive landing pages. Um, there can be too much of reliance on Facebook to determine if you've got a good idea or not. Uh, there can be these simplistic concepts of is, showing, is someone showing the intent to purchase? And if that's enough of people, that means that we've got enough traction, we've got a good idea. Whereas as service designers, we can bring to bear a lot more tools around prototyping and research um, to determine if not only to get better insights, but actually to determine if the concepts themselves um, are valuable. Lean Startup also is really, and I see this when I've worked within startups, uh, their teams are very focused on a single product and they see it almost uh, as if it's in a vacuum. They don't understand that service experiences are 
exist over time, exist over multiple touch points. Um, and that that really works counter to how we think. We have a holistic understanding of uh, of the product and see that in context of the bigger service and the, and the ecosystem around it. They, and this is something I see even my, my current clients uh, really kind of falling into the trap of doing, but it's, it's a natural way of startups thinking. They're very focused on a solution. They want to, they, they often even create the startup around a solution they want to bring to the market. And in that sense, they're in love with the solution and not in love with the problem, as, as service designers like to say. They think that, okay, we've got a great idea. We just have to find a way to get it into the market and, and people will love it. Um, however, and this can be really one of the sources of friction as a service designer in that context. You have to constantly say to people, look at we, let's really understand who your users are. Do they experience these as problems that you think they experience them, them as? Um, can we do research to get a better picture of who they are? Because they are not you and your colleagues within the startup team. They are a much broader community. And they're also not going to be, as I'll touch on in a moment, very, uh, very niche group of people who will put up with a lot of bad product. Um, it has to get bigger over time. So there's there's this kind of fundamental uh, challenge as well. Startups are focused on building an MVP, so satisfying just those um, uh, early evangelists that's, that Steve Blank says, um, whereas as service designers, we really are looking to create a service that's useful, usable, desirable, efficient, and effective from the, the first day. Now, um, okay, I, I just touched on this a moment ago. Lean Startup is concerned in the beginning, at least, with even friends of the founders and a few people who will have access to a bad product in the beginning just because it really fixes pains they have. As service designers, we say, no, let's really understand the, the wide variety of our customer groups that we're going to be serving and uh, represent them also not only on who they are, but who they'll be in the future. Um, so not just focus on, in the beginning, on these very um, forgiving small uh, community of users. Now, as service designers, then uh, we often look at whether services that we create are lovable, usable, valuable, and actually feasible. If you take the Lean Startup approach, the minimal viable product is essentially just about getting something that's feasible and a small bit of that feasibility out the door and seeing if there's enough traction. I've seen and I like um, from other people this concept of having a minimal lovable service. So making sure that you've got something that is, yes, a little bit feasible, but that we've also focused on the value, the usability, and even the lovability of it. Because I think that just the pure focus on feasibility and the pure focus on MVP um, uh, is, is a bit misguided sometimes. So I think we can bring this perspective and, and this wider uh, viewpoint into the beginning. It doesn't need to be startups don't launch fully fledged products, but we can change a bit how they, uh, how they think about things. So that's the first part of my talk. I'll now switch into this second viewpoint, which is what are the potentials and the challenges uh, perhaps of this context for service designers, for, for ourselves, so working within a startup um, or some, some innovation context. Now I've structured this around uh, five tips. The first is to be a bit of a chameleon and I kind of cringed a little bit when I described to you my first job title when I was working in this accelerator being a service design uh, and design thinking coach. And I, I have some um, friendly ways of criticizing design thinking as not being really the same as service design. It's not an interchangeable thing, but I found myself calling myself a design thinker in some ways, in some cases, because that was how our role was positioned. It frankly can sometimes be much better recognized in a big organization than service designers. So this tip is really about not being super focused on the name of who you are and what you bring and what your deliverables are called, but be flexible, adapt yourself into the titles that are understood if that's really necessary. Now, I hope you can get to calling yourself a service designer, but um, find some, some chameleon aspects into the way that you can bring value and what you're, what you're calling yourself and how you present yourself to a team. Secondly, and I've mentioned this in, in, in the beginning and even because it's something I've been doing today, the service ecosystem, and I've seen, thank you so much for sharing my article in, in the chat. This is that visualization I created many, many years ago, which takes the user perspective in the very center. What is someone's need in using a service? It looks at 
on a kind of uh, uh, time-based uh, basis. What are the interactions they go through with the service provider? Um, what are the touch points they go through? And and critically, what are the interactions and touch points that are outside of the control of of the service pr provider that you're working for? What is the context in which someone is buying insurance? Are they they're not just you as the insurance provider, but they're speaking to other people. They're looking at reviewer sites. They're speaking to a, even a broker, for example. So this first visualization of the complexity of a service is super important to show the way you think as a service designer um, and confront them, frankly, with the complexity in this, this holistic viewpoint. So I found it very useful to do early on uh, in a project. I also think we need to get comfortable with canvases. The, the startup world is full of canvases. We, as service designers, have a, a lot of visualizations and deliverables ourselves that are based on post-its, but things like customer journeys. The startup world has the business model canvas, value proposition canvas, even more niche things like um, uh, platform design toolkit. Um, I've developed a canvas myself, which I've, I can, I'll share with you about building a service perspective for innovation within a startup. I've created as a canvas very particularly because I know canvases are comfortable within startup teams. They can say, we're gonna to get together for a short workshop. Um, someone, and ideally a service designer, because we're good at that, facilitates it. And they can do a lot of work at once and, and create discussions around things. And as a service designer, if you can facilitate these activities, if you can learn how to do a business model canvas or a value proposition canvas, you vastly in, uh, increase your value to a startup team. I position myself even, even as I do on LinkedIn as being an innovation consultant. Now, what I'm really just trying to say is I know a lot of the, the, the tricks and the toolkits and the methodologies that pure innova innovation consultants bring to a project, but I have a layer of service design on top of that. Um, it's not a lot of work, frankly, to understand how to fill in a lot of these canvases. Um, a lot of the value, I think, in doing canvases, by the way, is the, the discussions they trigger, not really the outputs. And service designers are excellent facilitators and workshop uh, leaders. So uh, it's an easy thing to pick up. I do think it's about pushing the service perspective in general. So why I mentioned the service ecosystem is that's, that's one way to do it. But it's really about reminding people that a startup is going to be creating something that has to be seen within this context of the touch points that someone has with the service over, over time, what the channels are uh, involved. That service perspective is a bit anathema or, or kind of unknown to people who really don't think, think about a product or an app. Um, building it and creating this perspective in the team shows the value you bring. And once you've created that value, you can, you can really have a, a lot more impact. And lastly, it sounds maybe a little bit trivial, but it's just about learning the language of startups there. It's, it is very different. They even use things like terminology, like customer development, which looks a lot like design research that we're familiar with, but it's called customer development. They have growth hacking. Um, they have op, uh, prototyping or experimentation, as they call it. There's, of course, there's differences, but it's important to know what they're talking about, even if it comes comes down to things like how they're funded, so that you understand how they're working, because they are very different than a service design team with a big, slow-moving organization, and understanding their terminology can often be really key to understanding who they are. I'll end with one, uh, one kind of slide, and I... Uh, I've got a QR code and, and a link on the next slide too, but this is a bit of a snapshot of um, some months ago, actually, uh, uh, some of my own reading material once I got into the, once I got into the space. Um, it's a bit of a mix of books on, on different levels of innovation. Some of them, like uh, Running Lean and Scaling Lean, are really about the lean startup approach. Um, Designing better business is more about doing things like the business model canvas. Um, I know Sprint is in there. That's a little bit, uh, not really, a, you, know, kind of, you could say it's a startup book. Um, these I thought were all kind of really interesting and helped me to understand a bit their mindset. So um, it's not the service designers uh, book table or, or bedside table, um, but these are some, some books that I think are helpful to understanding uh, who innovators and who startups are. So that's my uh, that's my talk. I'll keep this on the 
on the screen for a moment if you want to get the, the link. So on, on that page on my website, I've put together uh, a link of resources, so some of the things I've written, um, and also the slides for this presentation. You can get them there. I'll share them. Uh, I'll share the link in the chat as well. But um, thanks. I hope this was a kind of uh, introduced some new perspectives, and I'm interested what questions have been coming through. My sure. first so question, they, they, Jesse, I have a quick question, Greg. How do I pronounce your uh, username? Great. So good, good question. And actually, you know, this is a word in Finnish. Um, I'll give you that you can see it because my logo is on the screen. It's the Finnish word for triangles, because I think as, as service designers, we're kind of obsessed with triangles. We have these visualizations around business, technology, and user. Um, so I wanted to find a word that had a hidden meaning to us as service designers, but uh, wouldn't be recognized as that. So this is yeah, it's, it's the word triangles in Finnish. And ironically, one of my very first clients was a Finnish university, and I was leading a big design, uh, design sprint, and I had 60 or 80 Finnish people in front of me uh, at, a, at a university, and I stood on stage and I said, look at folks, you need to tell me how I pronounce the name of my, my, my professional identity. And I had 70 Finnish people yelling komiot at me. So that's how you say it. Um, so thanks so much for presentation, uh, Jesse. Just before we go into the questions, very quickly, because you know, that book that you showed earlier, The uh, uh, Innovator's Dilemma, is obviously something very, um, everybody's mm -hmm. read it, and people have very different opinions about it. So tell us a little bit about that book, because obviously this is very much about the core what you just discussed here. So before we jump into questions, tell me more about that book, what do you think about the uh, Christians in the well, book? I think, I mean, what, one of the challenges that is that understanding how innovators work and understanding what their challenges are is about breaking out of the normal way of doing business and really effectively trying to make the argumentation for um, where the space should be for creativity and, and how you create the, the opportunity to do that. And I think most directly for those of us as service designers who are trying to understand where the opportunity for, for innovation is, even if you're working in a big organization, it's, it's about trying to make this, this space for it. And where I've seen in that very first uh, opportunity that I spoke about where I was within um, a large bank doing this, it was the constrictions of what uh, creating a space for innovation this, uh, that the, the bank wanted to do, yet being under all of the structure and the limitations and actually the lack of freedom that, uh, that this environment had. And that was, that was a, a real challenge. So, um, yeah. Very cool. Um, Brendan or Christopher, do you have, uh, do you want to start with a couple of questions from the audience? Absolutely. Uh, Robin, do you have a favorite you want to jump off with or do you want me to start up? Uh, let's go in. Um, well, we'll go back in order because uh, yeah. I was working with, uh, with Red on this question for a while. I think you for it. patiently. Um, so, Way back in the beginning of your conversation, uh, Jesse, you were talking about uh, talking with the client and uh, the role of the service designer and jack of all trades kind of being things uh, that we struggle with. Um, so Red was asking, how, how do we educate the client to be more concerned about the outcome than the cost of hiring the talent uh, to get to that outcome? Uh, and I think, you know, Red is struggling with some you know, the budget tends to dictate the work that he can do rather than, you know, the outcome that the company's trying to get to. So I think it's it's a very good question because it touches on one of our uh, kind of even an existential challenge service design has had from the beginning, and that's how you build the case for someone to invest in our work. And it's a challenge when what we do is less known within companies. Um, one key thing, I think, is to try to convince stakeholders and these decision makers at the top of an organization who really have a strategic mandate. Um, I think if you're trying to get a project manager down on, uh, on a product team to understand how they should pay for you as a service designer, you're you're a bit knocking on the wrong door in the sense that it's great if you get the, the, the access to work on a product team, but you're much better off and you'd be more successful if you can get in higher within the organization with, with a strategic mandate from someone up top. So I think it's about building the case to the important stakeholders, the ones with real strategic impact. And if you need to 
uh, look for examples within the within the the same industry for where service design has been successful. Uh, try to do a bit of a uh, yeah, it depends if, we, if you're a freelancer working in-house, kind of a pro bono project. Say, look, at let's, let's do a, a customer journey activity to look at the current uh, customer experience and take that within uh, two workshops towards ideation and show how we can involve users and come up with better ideas. Often those very kind of beginning experiences and exposure to service design can uh, help convince someone that it's a value they should invest in rather than just saying, look, I'm a service designer, this is important and uh, put me on a project and pay for me. That's excellent. It reminds me actually of a conversation we had with Andy uh, in our last session too about depending on the level of stakeholder that you're talking with too, the conversation is gonna be different right, their level of Zoom and how you actually approach it. So you wouldn't go in with UI mock-ups if you're talking to the executives at the top there, those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's a perfect segue into Matthew Shipp's question. Um, he says, I'm a molecular biologist and he wants to bring service design more to the ag tech community, but mm -hmm. getting service design philosophy past the PhDs has proved to be very difficult for him. So he asks, who should be his audience? So it's, it's really kind of interesting. I, I'm working again, as I said, within a big agriculture company myself. And in that case, the agronomists, the technical or the scientific people are also a, people, they're, they're stakeholders of mine. Um, I need to address all different stakeholders to make sure that people understand the value I bring. But I think some of the most important ones are the people that are really directly responsible for the end service or the end product. So if you can try to build your case and show the value to those people, um, I would consider, and again, I don't know the real context in which you work, but those scientists as being important stakeholders, but not the critical ones you need to get on board to have a real role there. Um, it would be the people responsible essentially for delivering a service to wh whomever your end users are. Convince them about your role and then manage uh, manage those other stakeholders and, and bring them on board and make them understand what you do. But I don't think they're at the end of the day gonna be your most important people to, um, to accept you and to uh, invite you and give you permission to work. That's awesome. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Robin, did you have one queued up that you wanted to ask? Or, or yeah, we have, a, we have a question here from Matthew. Um, and uh, the question was break down that. So in your in your model where you're talking about ecosystems, and I think you had interactions and touch points. Uh, yeah, it was a, a very high level model. <laughs> I'm sure it's got more details in it. But uh, Matthew was asking for just a quick explanation of uh, the difference between interactions and touch points from your point of view. Okay, good. Actually, it's a good question because I've been trying to help some of my colleagues on, on this current project, even in, in the last days, to understand those. What we try to do by pulling these apart is to not tell, first of all, to not tell the chronological story of an individual user experiencing a service. That's a customer journey. We have got a lot of different ways of doing that, but that's well understood. The service ecosystem is about taking one step back just to understand the complexity and to look at those on a phase by phase basis. By pulling apart touch points from interactions, we can look we can we can look at them separately. We can say, okay, what interactions is the end user involved with over time? Which of those interactions are uh, with the service provider directly? Which are ones that the service provider can influence but they don't own, and which are completely external? A quick way to say it, and, and the article that I've written about service ecosystems really describes this in detail, the interactions always start with the verb. So they're always something uh, increase, measure, do, take. They're, they're all verbs and they're, they're very short and they're touch point agnostic. They just say what someone's trying to accomplish regardless of where they're accomplishing it. Mm -hmm. On the other side, the touch points don't really say anything about what is happening, what the activity is. They just talk about the tangible places where the service uh, experience is happening, whether that's face-to-face -face with a, a staff member, whether it's on an app, whether it's through a WhatsApp message. So by divorcing those two, we don't talk about a specific story. We just get across the complexity of each phase of a service to, to raise people's awareness about it and, and to teach them about how we think. Mm, I, w I wonder if that framing too unlocks 
or at least it helps avoid the solutioning conversations, right? You're talking about the actions of the interactions or the, the goals, the jobs to be done, if that's the framework you use. Yeah, exactly. And, and we keep the user in the very center always. So it really keeps the focus and, and the need and the underlying need, which applies to the whole service and also the needs per phase are in the voice of the user, starting with I always. So that's super important to keep that user focus. Um, and it's important to say that a service ecosystem can capture a current uh, experience. So for a service that's already in the market and you're trying to improve, and you can also visualize a future service experience. You can say, okay, what will it look like in the future when, when this new product or service is launched? Um, and that is just a shared understanding within a team of what something looks like before you even get to doing customer journeys can be really valuable. So we have about five minutes left. Uh, Brendan, do you have um, a question from Sarah maybe? Uh, we may have time to maybe yeah, two questions. Yeah, we got, I've got one from Nick and then uh, maybe Robin can, can ask Sarah. So uh, speaking of startups, um, and Nick is asking if you can clarify the size or level of traction for the startup that you found the most success with. So he agrees that startup clients are usually solution driven, budget toward a very large scope. Um, and that can be too broad of an ask for customer custom development, app design, test launch, et cetera. So do you have any tips for selling or front loading the value of the service design strategy for the startup that you're, that you're offering? Um, so I think you have to kind of, you change your engagement as a service designer working with the startup over time. In the very beginning, you're, you're with them doing fundamental questions about what their proposition is, who their end users are, if you're capable of it about what their value proposition and their business model will be. Um, over time, you tr transition into the role of a, what you more commonly recognize as a service designer within a big organization. So as it, as it scales up, uh, ideally you keep your role and then you just become a more typical service designer in, in a big organization. I think it's, it's about understanding um, what the startup's needs are at the, are at the specific time, about the kind of chameleon aspect I spoke to, um, and recognizing also, to be really honest, in the very beginning of a startup's life, they may not have the 100% focus or need to have you in, engaged as a service designer. They, they're still dealing with fundamental issues about funding, for example. Um, they're uh, doing technology assessments. They're maybe doing basic beginning bits of prototyping. Um, they may not be able to keep you busy. One of the reasons I like the opportunity to work within an accelerator or an incubator context is your bills can be paid by the people who run that organization and then you can work on a smaller not full-time basis with other startups um, but when you're lucky and you can prove your value to a standalone startup um, they they'll they'll pay your bills um, but maybe it's also not going to be full-time five days a week depending on what stage of the life cycle they're in very cool thank you jesse um, maybe one more question brendan well, we wanted to ask Sarah, do you feel like uh, Jesse answered your question in that last answer? Do you feel like you got what you needed there? Um, there was a little, a little piece of it. Thank you, by the way. This is amazing. Um, there's a little piece of it that I wanted to clarify. So I've had a couple of startups come to me and say, I know my customers super well. I have tons of data on them because I've lived it, et cetera. So let's just test my prototype. Um, I have five hours with you. That's all I can afford. What would you do in those precious five hours? So five hours with the user or five hours with the client? Five hours with the client, tiny budget, just really want to, to get the most out of this. Um, and how confident are you that, the, that the, what their understandings and their knowledge of the user are correct? That's a great question. Uh, I would say I'm probably at like a six and a half. Seven out of 10. So I think one of the biggest values you can have with a startup is confronting them with the cold hard facts of who their users are because I think sometimes they have a bit of a warped vision of who the bigger market is. They design something that they're really in love with and they, they I'm sure are a success, but it can color their picture of who their end users are. So I would use the time to try to say, look, at, let's get some uh, rapid fire uh, interviews with real prospective customers who don't know you, yet we know are potentially relevant. Um, create a question list, uh, have them observe their questions, but don't allow them to lead it. And 
uh, and, and do some research and just see if you can either validate their, their understanding of who users are or even better confront them with the fact that maybe they've got a slightly different perspective than, than is true. Thank you, love it. Yep, Robin dropped the teach them to fish. Or as I prefer, you know, they say give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. I, I also like the one, build a man a fire, warm him for a day, set a man on fire, warm him for a lifetime. <laughs> Not quite the same, but sure. Jesse, thank you so much for being here and helping us. If we have any questions to forward to you, obviously, we know we're going to get a hold of you. Uh, a lot of very interesting question about you know, the innovation space, which is very different in terms of like you know, speed and, and resources than other companies have sometimes years to develop a very thorough understanding of, of a service and the orchestration part of it. So definitely very different. Um, I'm going to very quickly remind people that we are going to have a few more p uh, few more sessions for the remainder of the summer. Um, so don't forget on July 14th, we're going to have uh, Megan Miller and Eric Flowers from Practical Service Design giving us some really useful and practical tips about uh, uh, blueprinting. Uh, they have their own special uh, secret sauce of blueprinting, uh, which is very interesting. And then on August 11th, we'll have uh, Aza and Iran. They're going to be talking to us about government work, another very specific space where service design uh, have great potential to do a lot of good things. Um, and on September 8th, we'll have uh, Eric Wood from uh, Explain and he will uh, take us through a very different way to communicate and to tell a story of service design. Uh, his, his secret sauce is through uh, extreme visualization. So like uh, um, I let him talk about it, but he has a very interesting way of kind of like capturing this sense of a problem and kind of visualizing for his clients. It works very well. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting tool that we'd like to share with you. Um, and that's about it for today. So thank you so much for everybody to be uh, to join us today. Thank you, Jesse, of course, for being part of this. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Robin. Uh, thank you, all of you. Um, it looks like uh, Bertrand is having a very nice uh, summer evening in France on his patio. <laughs> I like how you strategically placed the shadow of the branch to mask your eyes from the bright sun. How That's poetic. Uh, well, thank you so much, guys. We'll see you, uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Take Thanks, care. Jesse. Thank you, everyone. Bye.